Hi, I'm Sarah Prendergast, and I used to be a math teacher. Now, I'm a STEAM teacher. Science, technology, engineering, art, and math, all wrapped into some really cool electives. Now, I'm still a math teacher. I teach a year-long Algebra one course, but I also teach some other interesting electives, including bridge building, paper engineering, and critical thinking. So today we're gonna look at some what, what STEAM really means. So as I've embraced the maker movement and the maker initiative, I've thought about what does it mean to make? The maker movement is about making constantly, making stuff, making things, making ideas, making mistakes, and learning while we do it. In some of the other classes at my school, like physical computing, students learn with Arduinos and Makey Makeys along with paper circuitry to learn about 3D printing and lots of weird, cool stuff. In main engine start, they take apart weed whackers, figure out what's going on in the engines, clean them, put them back together, and they still have to work. In physics of flight, they learn about kinematics and aviation as they drop eggs and build model airplanes. In robotics, they're building and designing their own ro robots that have to go through a maze that other students created. And in bridge building, our kids are learning about forces and about the history of bridges in our own city before designing and building their own bridges and then breaking them to see how strong they are. So students learn so much when they make a physical object. Sure, they're learning how to make a plane or a bridge or a robot, but they're also learning about how to think creatively, how to work together, and how to do some problem solving as they go through this. Maker education is not trying to replace our jobs. It's not trying to take over math and science classes. It's trying to enrich them. So kids are learning about volume and integration and calculus and then see a connection through a cardboard construction project. Or they're learning about angle relationships in geometry and then they use those symmetries to create a really great pop-up piece. Or maybe they're learning about F equals MA in physics and then we need that formula to figure out how strong our bridges are. So we're making, maker education isn't taking over math and science, it's just making it better. So today I'm going to talk about paper engineering and what my class is and what my kids have done in it. So definition, building something with paper. Think about that for a second. You've got an eight and a half by 11 white piece of paper. What can you do with it? What can you make from it? How can you take this two-dimensional piece of paper and manipulate it into something three-dimensional that has properties and is interesting and maybe is a little whimsical and maybe is certainly mathematical? That's not an easy task. But together with my 22 high school students, we tackled these questions and we had a lot of fun along the way. So we focused on four projects in paper engineering, the first of which was origami. There we go. So we've all played with origami, you've made the crane, you've made the little fortune teller, but we did way more in paper engineering. First, we watched Between the Folds, which is the best math, nerd, art documentary ever, and if you haven't seen it, please go watch it tonight. Um, and we explored the cut and fold problem as a ki kids made one cut across folded up paper to make a swan. We also made some of the traditional stuff like the lotus and the owl and the funny little elephant, which is just adorable. And then we looked at the math of origami. And we used Eric Domain's plans to make this hyperbolic paraboloid just by folding concentric squares on a large piece of paper. And we talked about the math behind a paraboloid. My 15 and 16 year old students don't know what a paraboloid is. They don't need to know what a paraboloid is, but they know what a parabola is and they can make connections about this familiar U shape that they see all the time to this cool flyy U shape that hangs in my classroom right now. And maybe someday in a couple years from now when they're in Calc 2 or 3 in college and they do get to paraboloids, they'll think back to this fun little paper project and make those connections. Next, we talked about slice forms. Now, slice forms are the coolest thing in the world. And if you don't know what they are, please go Google them after you get hooked from my presentation. You take a piece of paper and you cut slices in it, and then you interlock the pieces at right angles to create these cool 3D shapes. They can fold flat, they can flex, they can move, or they can just be really great to see. The kids had to make their own from a pattern that I gave them, and then they had to design their own pattern using the Silhouette Design uh, software up here, which is a great free software. And then I have a uh, Silhouette Cameo electric paper cutter, which works just like a regular cutter, uh, printer, but instead of ink coming out, it's a little X-Acto knife that cuts really complex shapes. So the kids made these funny shapes, 
And then they looked at the area of each individual slice and then the whole volume as the shape wall flexed and tried to compare and contrast those, seeing if there were any patterns. Was there a difference between the sphere and the torus? What about the paraboloid versus the cone? Or what about the cone and the dome? Those seem kind of similar, but the ratios didn't really make any sense. But they tried. Next, we looked at stack forms, which is a word that I made up to describe things like this. So for stack forms, the kids in groups find a 3D shape or make their own on Tinkercad. And then we downloaded the STL file from Tinkercad and uploaded it to 123D Make, which is a really great um, Autodesk free software that does lots of stuff, one of which is this slicing. So 123D Make sliced their elephant into these different pieces and produced this great uh, pattern for them. They put the pattern on cardboard and very patiently cut out all of the pieces, stacked them up, smacked some googly eyes on them, and we had a great little elephant. They also found the area of this, and they found the volume of their shape. So we all know that kids can find volume, and now they can find the volume of an elephant, or maybe a giraffe. So here's an integrated algebra regions question about volume. This is a tricky one where you have to divide by two to find the radius and then plug and chug to get the answer. <laughs> they need to know the formula. They've got to be able to know this one formula, and they get the answer here. Now, how do you find the volume of a giraffe? Hmm? You still need to know that one formula, but you need to know lots of other formulas, too, because you can't, it's just not cylinders here. You have to think about, what am I measuring? What do I, what do I need to measure? What kind of approximations do I need to use? So the kids came up with a volume for the giraffe, and then they had to, the, the tricky part was to be able to back it up mathematically. Because sure, I can say that it's like three cubic inches or whatever. But they had to be able to defend their answer. Next, we moved on to pop-up books, which seems the silliest, but was definitely the most challenging for students. Kids had to create a mini pop-up book with at least four pages, one light-up component, and five different pop-up components. Um, on the left here in the big photo, a student created an apple slice form and then turned it into a pop-up mechanism, which I didn't know you could do, and she figured it out. And then she used the paper cutter to cut out the city and the taxis. The cities stand up from the paper using tabletop pop-up, and the taxis move when you pull a tab. This took her three days. She had to design it, she had to prototype it, she had to build it. And it's not coordinate geometry. But she definitely was thinking spatially and working through problems to figure out how to make not only a 3D object, but a 3D object that moves just from paper and her ideas. The kids used this amazing how-to pop-up book, which talks a lot about angles and measurements and is very precise about pop-up. There was a lot of prototyping. They're not just throwing things together and making things stand up. It had to be perfect. I, had made it, I wanted them to make it perfect, and they eventually did too. We also did a couple workshops to show how to use a simple circuit with a switch so that they could put lights in their pop-up book. Now, with this project, with pop-up with pop books at least, they had the most freedom. And because they had the most freedom, we got a lot of variety of projects. Some of them were pretty simple, some of them were pretty great. This is the runaway girl created by an 11th grade student. Here's a little girl running away from home. There's a light behind the windows, but it has burnt out. So she runs away from home to the circus, naturally, where she sees that she stands up and tries to go into the circus, where she sees um, some lions and a tiger or an elephant, and then eventually gets eaten by a very scary clown. <laughs> this, was, this took her lots of extra time to create, but she got really into pop-up books. She was really passionate about it and created something really wonderful. So. My kids are making awesome stuff, but you're all asking, well, what are they learning, right? That's a big, component, or a big pushback of make maker education. What are they learning? Where are the standards? What's the assessment? I chose to focus on the International Society for Technology and Education STEAM standards, which are six non-content specific standards about creativity and critical thinking and using technology appropriately. At the end of each project, the kids had to reflect on these mastery topics and tell me what they had mastered. So it wasn't me giving them a grade and telling, oh, you mastered this, but you still need to work on this. They got to demonstrate and tell me what they mastered. And not only was it different for them, but I think it, was, it showed a, the reflective side of learning, which they don't really get to do in most of their regular classes. 
Making something changes the way these kids think. They're not just looking at the problems that we give them on a paper. They're looking at the problem that's presented to them and then connecting it back to their math or science class. They're making interesting things. They're making connections. And most importantly, they're discovering something that they haven't seen before. Maker education makes kids want to learn more about math or science. It makes them want to be better mathematicians and to do better in their science classes so they can make cooler stuff. These are some amazing classes that I want to teach. I want to teach woodworking. I want to teach upscaling art and problem solving and fish tank design. But I'm not an expert in these, and you don't have to be either. The great thing about maker education is that you don't have to be the expert in the room. You don't have to be an awesome game designer to help your kids create a great design. You can learn with them, and you might learn a thing or two from them as well. So maybe, you've, maybe you do pa pa paper engineering too. It doesn't have to be an elective class like mine. This could easily be transferred into an after school club or maybe a, a one-time workshop or a weekend of fun. The possibilities are really endless when you think about kids' creativity, maybe some interesting tasks and like 50 bucks worth of stuff. So maybe it's paper engineering, maybe it's not. Teach something better, do, go do something better. Explore it, have some fun with it, get the kids involved and make some steam. Thank you.